Kissing Tulips, Part 10. This time, the iron gates, with their tall spikes, are standing open for me as I approach, almost as if the graveyard itself had been waiting for me to come. The hill where Marianne is buried seems to call out to me, and I skirt the other tombs as easily as if I were jumping stones to get to the other side of a great river. Once there, I cast my eyes about for anything suspicious, but find nothing. The ground, which had the appearance of being disturbed on my last trip, is neat and tidy, as it should have been the night I came here. A single white tulip is even lying on top of the earth, as if someone has been here recently to pay their respects. Father, perhaps? I feel confused, but under it is a growing sense of uneasy peace. Perchance what I had experienced here had been nothing more than a waking nightmare, a byproduct of grief and too much drink. I reach out and lay a hand against the cold marble of Marianne's headstone, when a voice behind me makes me nearly jump out of my skin. I knew you'd come back, it says, soft and low. I turn abruptly and see the tall gentleman that I had met in the pub, still wearing his long brown coat and the hat that obscured the rest of his features. You. I say, feeling a little wary all of a sudden. What are you doing here? I had to come, says the stranger, and takes one step towards me. I slide to the other side of Marianne's headstone. I had to make sure you were safe. Don't come any closer, I say, and curse silently to hear the wavering in my voice. Who are you? What do you want? I want you to turn around and go home right now, Lydia, says the stranger, and something in the way he says my name roots me to the spot, chilling me. I know what you're doing here, he continues, but she's gone. Who are you? I repeat, feeling my fingers on top of the marble begin to dig in. In response, the stranger takes off his hat and lays it gently on a neighboring tombstone. The face under that hat is one I knew so well I could have traced a picture of his features in my dreams. Liam, I whisper and grip the top of the headstone harder to keep from fainting. What? You died? Yes. Liam replies looking very much as if the word pained him. But I didn't at the same time. He brought me back, Lydia. What? I reply, not understanding his meaning at all. I'm so sorry. Liam continued, moving closer. This is never the way I wanted you to find out. Don't take another step, I shout. Not until you tell me who you really are, and what the bloody hell you're talking about. Liam does as I instruct, but I can see from the look in his eyes that I've hurt him. Not him, I think. It. I understand your anger. Believe me. I too was angry when I woke up and discovered that he had abandoned me. He sighs. What I'm about to tell you may be hard to believe, but you must hear me out. Several months before I passed on, I had been planning something so idiotic and foolhardy that to speak of it now seems almost shameful. You and Marianne were the stars of my existence, and I know the long hours we spent in the nag's head, talking about the future and how we would move in the world, was very important for all of us. You both insisted that neither of you would be married, and laughed at the prospect of such an arrangement. What 
you never knew was that I harbored in my heart the desire to have both of you as my lifelong companions, to walk in this world together as a unit such as no one had ever seen the like of before. But I knew that that dream was a hollow one, and one night I went to the pub alone to drink away my feelings. That's when he approached me. He saw me slumped in the corner of that place and asked me why I looked so downcast. My head swam with drink, and it seemed I had no will of my own at that moment, and told him all in a rush my shameful feelings. He seemed to sympathize with my plight and offered to help me. I asked what he could possibly do to help, and he told me to meet him the following evening and would tell me how. Not really believing that he was in earnest, I did as he instructed. A fact I very much regret now. When I arrived, he was waiting and asked me if I had an image of the two of you for, in order for his plan to be set in motion, he needed to see the object of my desire. I produced the little cameo I had commissioned in your likenesses two years prior, and he took it from my hand like a man being given a precious gift. I did not know it then, but the mere sight of both of you captured his heart, just as surely as mine had been captured for years. He stared at your images for the longest while, before he addressed me again, telling me that my desire was well founded, and that everything would be taken care of. I asked what he could possibly do to secure such a thing, and that was the moment he revealed to me his darkest secret. He turned to face me in that chair by the fire, and in his eyes I could have sworn I saw two flames inside the irises that had nothing to do with the flickering inside the grate beside us. A shiver ran down my spine, but he leaned forward and touched my cheek with cold fingers. An electrical charge went through me at his touch. I wanted to recoil from his hand, but something held me there. The world around us seemed to blur as he told me in a voice that was like melting honey. The power to grant life and death were in his command, and if I but spoke the word, he could give it to me, to us in an instant. To possess the sweetest tulips in the world was within my grasp. I had but to agree to his terms. My throat had gone quite dry, but I managed to rasp out a question. What terms might those be? He smiled at me, and I thought, just for a moment, I had caught the glimmer of one sharp tooth. A kiss, he said, was all he required. My brain fought for control at his request, but as my eyes roamed over his handsome features, my pulse began to race. What would be the harm? I surmised. Leaning forward, I closed my eyes and felt his lips brush over my own, soft and full, like a woman's. But the light trace of stubble against my skin reminded me of whom I was kissing. Not unpleasantly so, which is the God's honest truth, even though I know that that might offend you. I can't recall how long we remained in that tableau, but I do remember the sweetness of the moment and the uncontrollable shiver I felt as he slid down my neck to place even more kisses along my jawline. Afterward, I remember very little, except for a slight ache in my neck and a 
burning desire for more. He left me there, but with instructions to return the following evening, which I dared not refuse, for I believed that whatever was transpiring between us would bring you and Marianne closer to my embrace. The next night, I did not hesitate to come straight away, and this time he led me to a more private corner within the pub. Again, he asked me to produce the precious cameo, and I did, readily. After staring at it a long while, I couldn't believe how eager I was for him to kiss me again. The mark on my throat, which I had very cleverly hidden, hidden with my cravat, had been throbbing all day, but I had done everything I could to ignore it. When he returned the cameo to me, I felt relieved, and the kiss that followed was even more powerful than the last one. The world became a hazy sort of mist, and when he pulled away, the ache in my throat hurt worse than ever, but I didn't care. Liam stopped momentarily and looked at me, almost as if he were afraid to go on. I couldn't have spoken to him to tell him to stop, even if I wanted to. The strangeness of his story, and how eerily it echoed what had happened to Marianne, warred within my head. I wanted him to stop, needed him to stop, but the desire to know the truth won out and I waited for him to continue. I didn't understand what was happening. Didn't know that the thing I had allied myself with was doing me more harm than I could have possibly grasped in my weak mortal understanding. When I tell you, Lydia, that I had no power of my own to refuse the command he gave me to return the following evening, it's the truth. The God's honest truth. I went to him like a trained dog who knew nothing other than to obey the orders of his master. But that night, that night, I couldn't have known what was in store for me. The room the barkeep sent me to was bare, save for a wooden bed and a few chairs. He told me to sit, which I did, then asked to see the cameo once more, which I gave to him without hesitation. When I asked if this was the night that our plans could be set into motion for requiring both you and your sister, he smiled, a strange smile, and slipped the cameo inside his vest pocket. I felt confused and rose ever so slightly from my chair to ask him to give back what was mine. But a voice inside my head told me to sit back down, and I did so, not of my own volition. I waited silently as he paced the room and went to the window to look out. Then he told me that what I wanted was impossible. But I was too weak a man to ever hold such treasures as the one he now carried in his pocket. That the game had played out, and now that he had what he wanted, there would be no need to have another king in this game. My head went up sharply at his words, and in a flash he was on top of me. The chair fell over backwards as we tumbled to the floor and I had a moment to catch a glimpse of his face, the eyes that burned red with an unholy light. He gripped my throat hard, and when I felt the bite, I knew what I had done, that what I had been playing at was doomed from the very moment I had said hello to this man, this beast. My vision turned murky, and I died, right there on the floor of a cold room, underneath an even colder man. 
The wind whispered against the trees as I stood looking at Liam. His story seemed to have exhausted him, but his eyes were bright with some emotion I couldn't name. I opened my mouth and tried several times to speak, but nothing came out for a long moment. Finally, my lungs seemed to catch air, and I managed one feeble question, one that I had asked before, but couldn't seem to stop asking. Liam's eyes turned sad, and he looked away from me. I asked myself that same question night after night since I crawled my way out of my own grave. What I am is something beyond hope of heaven, one of the undead, a blood drinker, Nosferatu. The word echoed inside my head like a bell being struck. It rattled and keened and made my head ache. Then, Marianne, I managed, still groping for words that would not come. What happened to her here that night? I'm sorry, Lydia. Marianne's fate was tied to mine, but the change, shock of waking in her own coffin must have driven her mad. I did what I had to do to keep you alive. Do what? What did you do? I demanded, tears beginning to prick the backs of my eyes like so many needles. Don't make me say it, Liam said. His voice had been so low, it was hard to hear him over the sound of the wind. Then I will, I spat, anger beginning to take the place of my shock. You murdered my sister. You killed Marianne. Would have killed me too if the opportunity had presented itself. You know that's not true, Liam protested. I would never allow harm to come to either one of you. Then what have you been confessing to me all this time? Do you really expect me to believe you are blameless in all this? You told me yourself that you wanted both of us and succeeded in taking Marianne away from me. It wasn't me. Who then, Liam? Who else is to blame for this other than you? If it wasn't for your lust, Anne and I might have had a chance to life beyond all this death. It was the Baron, Lydia. Liam shouted, and the force of his voice rocked me back, and I paused, despite myself. What? Believe me, Liam continued, in a voice that had taken on a different tone. If I could bring Anne back to both of us, I would. And I'll never cease being sorry for what I've done. But what was set in motion the night I died was a plan to take you and Marianne for himself. The Baron Lydia. He is the man behind all this. A pause. The next barrage of words dying on my lips the instant the name of the man I had dreaded these last few weeks formed itself like a beacon in my mind. Images began to rifle through my brain. So fast it was hard to keep up with them. The Baron asking me to dance the night not too long after Liam was dead and buried. Him being strangely helpful in the days following Marianne's illness. The marriage proposal. The strange encounter in my living room. God, I breathe, and suddenly the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. The Baron is suddenly there, like the whisper of his name was enough to call him to this place. As if sensing his presence, 
Liam whipped around to face him. There is no need to look at me that way. He says, in that same voice Liam had described earlier. Like melting honey. Honestly, Liam, you should know better than to go around filling Miss Lydia's head with such trifling stories about me. When you know that they aren't true. They are the truest words I have ever spoken to anyone. And well, you know it. Liam retorted through bared teeth that I could not see, but could hear nonetheless. The Baron smiled. Not a pleasant smile, but one that dripped poisonous disdain. Yes. He replied. Yes, I do believe that your incessant drivel is more truth than you've ever allowed yourself during the whole of your miserable life. But it doesn't matter much now. I could see Liam's shoulders stiffen as he replied. What do you mean? Can't you guess? The Baron asked, his disdainful smile widening even further stretching his handsome features into something more monstrous than I had ever seen before. I'm going to kill you, Liam. For real this time. To be plain, the fact that you are here at all is quite a shock to these old bones, I can assure you. You should be pleased. Nothing has surprised me thus far for over three hundred years. The Baron's eyes travelled to me, and my body turns as cold as the stone under my palms. Dearest Lydia, he croons, the most beautiful flower of all. I couldn't tell you before how sorry I am about Marianne, but in this place of all places, your hands upon her sweet stone. Allow me to tell you this time that I would have loved her just as much as I love you. To his credit, Liam is right. The shock of waking in one's own grave is never a pleasant one. And dearest Anne did not have the strength of mind to weather such a change. With you, however, I know it will be different. For you are strong, and filled with a desire for life like no other woman I've ever met. He takes a step towards us, and I see Liam's hand go to the inside of his jacket. Don't take another step, he commands. Or what? The Baron asks, his tone mocking. Or I'll strike you down like the monster you are. Liam replies. Be careful what you say. Replies the Baron. Or you might find yourself face to face with a real monster. There is a shift in the air, like the crackle of lightning. The Baron's form wavers in front of our eyes like a mirage, and suddenly, standing before us, is a creature of indescribable proportions. A large grey bat, standing on its hind legs, with wings that seem to blot out the moon. I scream, and in a flash of movement the creature has taken flight and is coming towards me. There is the sound of a gunshot, but it misses the creature by inches and instead strikes the side of Marianne's tombstone, chipping away the marble and causing me to fling myself to the ground in order to avoid being struck. In the distance, I hear Liam call out my name and I turn to cry out for him when the monster lands itself on top of me. I scream once more and try to scrabble out from underneath the weight and breadth of his wings. My struggles become useless as the dirt has no grip under my gloved hands 
and with one claw the creature drags me underneath him. I can hear the sound of Liam as he has begun to ascend the hill, but I know he will not make it to me in time. The bite of the creature's teeth into the soft flesh of my neck is both terrible and the most exquisite pain I have ever felt in my life. It rips through my body like fabric being rent in two, and for the briefest of moments, I can see visions of what might be the future. A beautiful girl in a blood-red dress, dancing in the arms of a handsome stranger, before luring him to some secluded place and taking what is hers by right of seduction. A pale red head, naked and writhing in ecstasy on pale fingertips. A thighs milky white before a kiss turns them crimson. The Baron, half transformed into this creature who now holds me captive, thrusting himself inside of me as I giggle in delight pull him in to kiss a mouth full of teeth too sharp to be human. The images are so passionate and terrible, and all I can feel is a desire of them. The need to be rid of this life and take up the one that is more than flesh. Time slows to an agonizing pace in which I can hear my heartbeat growing fainter. beads around my neck have come free from their chain and slide to the ground under me, falling away from my throat like drops of water. In their absence is another image, one that brushes itself across my eyes in a waft of sweet-smelling hair. Lydia, says a voice, so faint that I am barely able to recognize it. When it comes again, I know whose voice it is. Lydia, Lydia. Lydia. it says again. Marianne? I think. But no, she is dead. Lydia, Lydia. Lydia. says the voice once more. Lydia, Lydia. 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 you You must must listen to me. me. Don't Don't let let this monster deceive you. We promised each other that we would never be beholden to any man. Would you break our promise now? Trade it for pretty pictures. And I think weakly and cough a little. Blood drips down my chin and I taste the bitterness of it in my mouth. I don't have the strength to fight him. Yes, you do, comes the voice, as sharp and petulant as she was in life. You were always the strong one. That much of what he said is true. Open your eyes. I do as my sister instructs, and there, right in front of me, is the silver cross. It winks at me in the light of the moon. I stretch out my hand to grab it, drag it towards me, before thrusting the point of it against the skin of the bat. A howl as that of a demon erupts from the throat, whose vocal cords have shaped themselves into an organ of terror. The teeth have left my throat as I feel him reel above me pain momentarily distracting him from his goal. I can hear Liam now, as he has clearly reached the both of us. There is a terrific scuffle, as man and beast war with one another, both snarling and scraping like feral animals, until at last there is a sound, a whisper of something sharp being drawn roughly against skin. Blood rains down around me, coating me from head to foot and falling into my open mouth, which can't help but gasp for breath. I'm aware of a heavy body falling, 
mere inches from where I am lying. Then Liam is beside me, and cradling my body. My ears are ringing, and though I see his lips moving, I can't quite make out the sound as he continues to speak to me. Liam, my childhood friend, a man who I might have taken as a lover if he had had the strength of mind to ask me. Liam, a man who had returned to me, even in death. Who would be there to comfort him now? Not Marianne. Not I. The story with which we had all set out to find had reached an end. With blood-soaked fingers, I reached up to touch his face. As my eyes begin to close, I imagine that the imprint I leave there will be something more than blood beautiful smear, perhaps in the likeness of a tulip in full bloom. <laughs>